Hi, welcome to XRT Party. Today my guest is Ada Rose Cannon. She's a staff engineer and developer advocate for Samsung, as well as W3C Working Group Co-Chair. We will talk about her work at W3C, as well as her grandmother's gaming career. Hi Ada, welcome to my tea party. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's going to be a fun afternoon. I know, it's so good to have you. We never have a chance to talk about WebXR. <laughs> now is well, our chance. Uh, yeah, only you only get to talk about it three days a week. That's I all. Know. That's all. That's not much. <laughs> um, can you tell us what you are doing at Samsung and also uh, at the Immersive Web W3C Working Group? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, at Samsung, I'm a developer advocate for the web browser Samsung Internet. Um, Samsung Internet, for those who aren't aware, is a Android web browser, um, a pretty good one in my opinion. Uh, we have a focus on like privacy and security um, with like built-in ad blocking and tracking blocking and stuff like that. So it's it's pretty good, um, which it may seem weird that I'm like talking about XR. Um, but um, as well as like as part of the developer advocacy work, I work in web standards and I work with Aisha Gul as a co-chair on the Immersive Web Working Group. Um, we're both co-chairs of the group. Um, and because um, Samsung, Samsung as a company is really interested in um, XR, so it um, kind of goes hand in hand with what I do. Um, it is really great, so, yeah. great to uh, have Samsung um, really interested in WebXR. I know that your coworkers are doing a lot of stuff in the WebXR area too. Uh, yeah, they are. It, um, it, um, it's really great seeing so, um, some of the work they're doing to bring WebXR in, into the browser. Um, like each each time we do a new release, it seems like they're supporting more and more of the API, and it's it's very exciting. Uh, I used to have a Samsung phone and also it came with the headsets that you could put your phone in. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I've got like a bunch of them down here. I literally have a cupboard full of, of like, nice. headsets, like all the Gear VR ones, because of course I bought, I bought every generation of Gear VR that came out. Yeah, it was really nice, and it w uh, they there was a, a promotion, I think, so it came with the phone when I ordered it, and it, it had the ha um, hand controls as well, which made it really mm -hmm. easy and very accessible. I was very happy to have it. Uh, it's a really it's a really cool device. I just wish it was um, st uh, still supported. Um, it's not. Um, no, uh, Samsung like have kind of stopped supporting the Gear VR as of I think about a year ago now, um, which is a real shame. Um, but they're more focusing like as a browser, we're more focusing on handheld AR at the moment, um, and that's some of the stuff that's coming next in our browser. That is exciting. Um, how does it work on the flip phone? The new flip phone. Ah, I haven't tried it on the flip phone yet because they're like gold dust to get hold of um i wish i wish i had a one to hand um um uh we have one z flip for the whole team um and that's like so um i haven't had a chance to try ar on it yet but hopefully soon uh that is sad i know how it feels though i didn't have access to a hololens 2 for a long time because we couldn't take them out of uh, the you know workplace <laughs> It's so nice that it's uh, available now. Have you, did you get to try? Yeah. I'm... Oh yeah, you did. Pardon? HoloLens too. I was asking if you get to try the HoloLens yeah. too, but yeah, you did, and I was there. <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, you're the one who showed it to us. Um, it's a really cool device. I really want one. Like I can't afford it. I'd be in huge trouble if I if I bought one. But I do really want one. Um, like the the fully immersive AR is just oh, so good it is so like, much i really fun. really like it and i had so much fun watching you guys try it for the first time too because like everybody's mm -hmm. looking at their hands as if they're discovering it for the first time and it's really fun it we should give those videos to uh, actors to practice like <laughs> 
<laughs> when you wake up in somebody else's body, how does it look? It's really funny how like the looking at your hands is like the the AR um, equivalent of like the VR face. Like it's the first thing people do is is they're just like. <gasps> <laughs> yes, um, it is really fun. Um, is there anything in particular that you're working on lately or you're excited to work on? Um, I've been playing, well, I've been working on a new demo, um, just trying out um, the, um, actually I'll roll back a bit because um, before I mentioned that, um, so inside the Immersive Web Working Group, we maintain a library called um, um, WebXR Input Profiles which give you the, like the 3D models and the um, information, all the information you need to render the model and have all of the buttons react correctly to what the user is doing. And, um, and so I really wanted to give that a go. So I've been working on a demo to play with that. Um, so I started off by just building a locomotion demo. So, um, you can like point and click and it draws like an arc and where, where the arc falls is where you're going to teleport to. And that was like a really fun demo to build. Um, and Brandon, who's also, um, who's an editor in the immersive web working group, um, has built, like has taken like the demo I was working on and just ran with it and like extended it um, a lot further. So I'm really looking forward to see some of the work he does around that. So it's kind of cool when like the work you do gets like taken even further i know uh first time somebody did that i cried <laughs> i really did cry um because it was so beautiful and like oh my god how could you <laughs> yeah it's amazing when someone like you do something and then they're like oh this is really nice and then they like take your code and make something like a thousand times better and you're just like okay yep, yeah oh, props that was amazing <laughs> And it's Brendan. It's it's really nice, you know. He's a very busy person too. But uh, he's very generous with his time to create, as you are too, create the WebXR examples. What are the examples? Mm -hmm. Other examples uh, that you want to see? Maybe some other people who uh, are listening might want to build. So the thing which I really want, and I keep trying to start, but like um, it's slightly out of my area of expertise for modeling is um, I want to see avatars for social VR with like um, with like inverse kinematics or some kind of um, some kind of method for doing um, like elbows and shoulders and hips and stuff. Just so like you've got your inner scene and you have like a presence and a body which you can customize for social VR. And it's the kind of thing where we have like a lot of the components you need for social VR, but making like a really nice avatar that also moves to like for the user is something which I really, really want to see, especially if it's just like a drop in library for like 3JS or Babylon or A-Frame or something, like something where you can just drop it in and use it and not and then worry about the other parts of social VR. Um, Cause it's like, it's such a big problem to solve. Um, like making a, like just making the assets alone to let someone customize the avatar. is just a huge, huge job, let alone like doing the, um, like the rigging and the models and making it customizable and work across browsers. It's a, it's a huge task, but one I would love to see uh, managed that is true also it would be very you know um hard to render at all times because people move all of the time and uh, a lot of people moving at the same time and trying to uh just keep track all of the uh, inverse kinematic will be really really uh hard to do mm -hmm. i definitely think it's gonna be one of those things where you'd end up like calculating your own ik in the headset and then um working out the position of all the joints and then like encoding them in a, in a, in an array buffer and then concatenating them on the server and sending them over web sockets to everyone is probably like the most efficient way to do that. Um, but that's like the one bit, like the one tiny part of the problem 
which is the bit I'm actually good at, like doing perf- like high performance data stuff like that is actually the the one bit I can solve. There's just everything else. I'm just like, oh yeah. Uh, did you get the practice while you were working on games for PlayStation? Um. So unfortunately, no. The work I was doing on PlayStation um, was um, I was just making themes for the um, um, for the PlayStation Three, which was really fun. Getting to actually like work with a like an actual real development kit and um, and doing like cool graphic stuff there. And and my experience there um, actually made me pretty good at three D modeling at the time. Um, although all those skills are now totally gone and. I couldn't 3D model my way out of a Utah teapot. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was good though. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I haven't modeled in, let's see, maybe, oh yeah, seven years. Um, I don't remember anything. I wonder how it's going to look. Maybe I should stream when I reopen and we try to do the same thing and uh, get lost in the programs. That would be maybe maybe we like all the coaches and editors and like the working group need to like collaborate on um like building a 3d scene and we can show off how terrible our modeling skills are <laughs> it's like look i made a tree <laughs> which is just a stick <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah and modeling people is uh, the hardest especially in a way that the animation uh, works well it really is because um um, if you go too realistic, then it's really easy to fall into like the uncanny valley, um, or even or even if you don't go that realistic, it's easy to do something where it glitches out in a weird way, and then it's just total body horror, scary stuff. Um, but all, and then combining that with like the freedom to like customize it and let users like change that avatar in any way they want is so difficult. Uh, there was a really cool open source project though. Um, it was called Human something. <laughs> Can't remember. I'll find and put the link uh, for this and send it to you as well. It was a really good tool, and this is a long time ago, before seven years, maybe ten years old. Uh, and mm-hmm. open source project where you start with the body, and then there was a lot of customizations that you could do. Um, I'm don't think there was a, I mean, the models uh, were good for animation. I not mm-hmm. sure, but uh, the thing is you can also start from a model and it makes it a little bit easier to try to uh, remodel this right for uh, animation. Yeah, I, if, I wish I had, if I just had enough budget that I could like commission an artist to, to make the fundamental bits, then that, I think that'd be a really great thing to do, but. Fortunately, I haven't got like, like the kind of budget you would need to to commission that. I think that would be a, a really good place to start. But um, um, I think I think it's definitely something which um, an artist needs to be um, hired to, to work on. Uh, that is true. And there are so many people who wants to start learning modeling a little bit too, like developers uh, who want to create their own content. My advice personally is don't uh, just hire someone or buy it or find a free one because it t- it's a totally different skill set and it's a hard thing to learn. It takes a long, long time. But what do you think about it? Oh, yeah, definitely 100%. Um, just the skill set for 3D modeling is entirely um, more on the art focused. Um, like you need really good anatomy skills. Um, some of the best 3D modelers I know didn't come out of the computing side, but went from traditional media straight into working in like ZBrush and stuff like that. Or is it ZBrush? Um, I think it's ZBrush. Yeah, ZBrush. Um, oh. the, the last thing I did was uh, take a ZBrush class actually seven years ago, seven or eight years. Uh, and that's how we started. You're right. Like we started with the skeleton. And uh, we had to learn a lot about the anatomy and like the names of the bones and everything else. And then we mm-hmm. put a layer of uh, muscles on top of it. And then we put a layer of skin on top of it. And uh, it's fascinating. And it's 
really you don't really know who's gonna come out of that <laughs> yeah that's incredible um it's interesting like i never thought i'd have to know like the names of the bones in the human hand but seeing the work manish is doing on the webxr hand input and he's um and he's describing like the the model you need for the hand and then naming all of the joints after their like the the actual bones in the hand i'm just like okay yeah it, today is today i'm learning biology i guess um i i just noticed that you you have the same background with manish which is physics yeah we we both have a physics background how was making the switch for you to uh being a um, for me it was uh kind of um like I'd always had like a computing side to me. Um, so I went to school before like ICT was like widely taught to people. So when I went to university, I had like no, no computing background. Um, and um, so I went to do physics instead. And whilst I was doing my degree, I um, I took all of like, the computing modules I could. Um, because before university, I'd been like doing some like making websites and I used to build like really terrible little 2D games in the web um, using like uh, JavaScript to push around image elements. And it was it was really cheesy, but like I used to love doing it. Um, and I kind of kept it up as I went to university and um, I even built like a little 3D renderer based on like the... Um, the canvas 2d um context um which which was kind of fun um and so i used that to like get into like some of the computer science modules at university so i did like a graphics course and an operating systems course and and funnily enough even though my degree was physics like the computer science ones were probably the funnest parts of my degree um and the bits i still use to, use today um and it's kind of out of that that i like I was kind of, I've kind of always been straddling like the web and graphics as um, throughout my whole degree. Um, so when I was at the Financial Times, I was doing like a lot more web stuff. But then web, when web VR started to come around a lot more, um, all the stuff I'd been tinkering with, with 3JS and stuff, I was making games and stuff, really like came back again. And then, and now I'm doing graphics and the web because like WebXR brings them both together, which is really nice. They're just really cool. Also, physics is such a uh, you know useful degree for graphics where you want to do any physics simulations too. It is actually yeah, it is really handy. Um, and like a lot of the tricks I learned in like my mechanics modules and stuff like that, like yeah, it 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 sticks with you and. Um, um, and like some of the mathematics stuff is really interesting. Um, but I don't use it as much as like, as, as much as I ever thought I would at university. Although I did do integration. Um, like I had to, I had to work out the position of a particle in a, under constant gravitational pull. Um, and so I had to use integration for the first time in probably too many years more more years than i'd like to admit yes exactly <laughs> uh yeah i saw it in high school the last time i saw any integration <laughs> it's a long time let's say um tell me what, what was working at financial times were you um working on the general application or you mentioned canvas were you interested in doing the visualizations I know they have really good um, ones. Yeah, so my work at Financial Times was really interesting. Um, but I didn't do a lot of graphic stuff at the Financial Times, at least not at first. Um, so um, my early work at the Financial Times was on the um, the the Financial Times web app. So this was like a super early web app. This um, like aimed at like the first model of iPhone, early Blackberries. Um, so targeting like the really early mobile browsers at the time. Um, and back then, um, like web compatibility um, was definitely not as much of a, um, 
um, as something you could expect as you can today. Um, so the um, um, it was a really difficult task supporting these wide variety of browsers across all these devices with a single product. Um, um, and we were doing stuff where we were doing an actual like installed installable web app before service workers, before the web app manifest, before anything like that. Like you, the the app was offline using app cache, uh, which was the old horrible horrible web API for making stuff work offline. Um, but the work we were doing fed directly into the standards efforts for the APIs, which eventually became stuff like service worker and the web app manifest. And so that's actually what kind of got me um, inspired to work in standards, um, just seeing it happen a, um, around me. Um, but then after that, I went over to, um, so I did that for a year and a half. And then like, Shortly before I moved to California, I moved over to the Financial Times' like R&D um, team. Um, and that was when we were doing like lots of short prototypes of products. So we would, um, um, we would come up with an idea, we would build and test it all, um, and deploy it all within two weeks. And then we would leave it running for a short amount of time. And then we would analyze whether it had been successful and if so, we would try and find another team in the Financial Times to take it on and look after it. Otherwise, we would like decommission it and shut it down and then write up our findings, uh, which was really interesting because you ended up with um, like every week you'd be working on something entirely new and unrelated to what you were doing before. Um, and there was definitely some more graphic stuff in there and some really early work with doing virtual reality in the web there before um, the web VR uh, the web VR API was around. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds so much fun. Uh, is there any learnings that you can share now? Um, oh gosh, not off the top of my head. I'm sh I, I, I learned a ton, but um, I think mostly the stuff I learned was how to get really good at, because our time budgets were really tight for the amount of time we had to develop stuff. So working out how long something would take to implement and just being able to look at something and being like, yes, I think I think we can implement this in four days and then doing that. And so, yeah, you learn to get good at that pretty quickly if you're working in that kind of in that kind of time budget. What kind of four days are we talking about? Is it a hackathon four day or a normal, you know, five to nine to five? Yeah, this is. I definitely couldn't work like hackathon schedule like all for for all the time I was doing that because I was doing that for about three years, um, all in all, um, and um, there is no way I I could um, do hackathons. This is just normal nine to five, like come to come to work, do the work, and then leave it at work and go home. And that I have to say that is something I miss, like doing doing web standards and developer advocacy, like you, you lose the nine to five. Um, it's, I don't even consider it anymore. Like it's currently half seven in the evening and I still have more work I need to do today. Oh, thank you for um, spending the time with me here. Oh no, gladly, gladly. Like I'm very happy to, I'd, I'd rather be doing this than, than making another slide deck. Um, I find that working from home makes it really hard to leave work at work to what do you think mm. not go into an office and just it's here <laughs> um so it helped so all the t so i i worked remotely at the ft for 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 quite a few years and although i had an office like i spent the mornings um working from home and i still had like a work set up there and i did get like a lot better at um, after doing it for a while, being very good at leaving, um, like putting my work stuff away and then putting it out of you so that I can, I can enjoy being home and not like working weird hours. Um, uh, now I have a home office. Um, that's where I am at the moment. Um, and, um, here it's, um, it's a bit better, um, cause I never had an office before, so this is nice. So now I can finish work, I can shut the door, and then I can forget about it until the next morning, um, which is helpful. Because before I was always working at like the dining room table and stuff like that. 
Yeah, it makes a humongous difference. I used to work from home again in another place, which I didn't have a room, but I had a section, uh, which made it easier for me because I wasn't looking at the you know whole home setting. But anytime I go sit in the couch, it's still there uh, that I can yeah, see it's, it. it's it's hard. Like it's really horrible when you sit down to dinner or like sit down to like do something fun. And then you have to like push your like work laptop and like all your papers and stuff like out the way. And it's just like, oh yeah, I forgot that exists. Yes. Um, I'm, I feel very lucky to, you know, have a uh, room now. It's really hard uh, for a lot of people, including my partner, <laughs> to work from a kitchen table. Mm -hmm. Do you have... Yeah, we're... Oh, pardon, Karen. Um, do you have any tips um, for productivity? Like how do you manage working from home and be disciplined to work to actually do the work um so when I first started working from home it was it was really hard um I was like the first person on our team to work remotely and I was kind of like the test case and so I was pretty much under the um under the guide of you either make it work or no one's going to work remotely ever again that's a lot um, of pressure yeah, and I didn't want to ruin it for everyone else. So yeah, I would. Um, so one thing that helped was that my my daily stand up with everyone was at seven in the morning, um, ca uh, California time. So I would I would wake up at quarter to seven every day, um, get dressed, have my stand up, and then I would start working. And then it would be a, a couple of hours until my partner woke up. Um, so then I'd already be like well into my day. And so just having the, um, like the discipline to, to wake up and go to work, um, and do it was, it was tough. Like there were times where I'm just like, yeah, I want to, I want to go play video games or I want to go for a walk or something. And it's like, nope, I've got to sit down and wait till my lunch, lunch break. And then like try and keep to a, a, a rigid schedule. But now it's, now it comes a lot more naturally to me like I know if I'm if I'm in the office I'm in work mode like I'll have my work things around me and it puts me into like the work mood which which also helps uh, now I'm so used to it. it's really hard to go into an office and work because there's so many distractions uh, I know like working remotely makes work made makes work into an office really hard because all of my colleagues are around me and I'm just like I can just walk up to them and start chatting and or they'll come up to me and start chatting and it's a lot harder to actually like to get the task accomplished um so i tend to find if i go into the office i i do all of the things which need people involved so if i need to get people's opinion about stuff i'll like do it in the office and then when i go home i can just focus on getting a, something completed because when there's no distractions yeah um, I was doing a similar thing, put uh, every meeting in the same day where I go to the office. So I get to hang out. Uh, something a little bit nicer now is that everybody is remote and you don't feel like you are left out <laughs> from the office conversations. Um, mm -hmm. It must be hard to just be the only person who's not there in the office and everybody heard something that you haven't heard that's been one of the interesting things about um, co-chairing the immersive web working group because almost everyone else is in West Coast America, either either Seattle or um, or or Silicon Silicon Valley or San Francisco, um, and so a lot of people are just walking over to each other's office buildings and like even if they're in other companies and just saying hi and having corridor conversations. Whereas I'm like forever trapped on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, but now everyone's having remote conversations. So it's like, it's really actually put me on an even footing with the rest of the group. That is true. And thank you for, you know, making the late nights for W3C and the feature of the immersive web. Uh, we are all in a comfortable 10 a.m. meetings most of the time and yeah. you're missing dinners mostly. Oh, I'm just so happy that I'm able to help. And like, if it means pushing dinner back an hour, I like, um, I think it's definitely worth it. Um, How did so, you get involved with W3C? Um, so when I joined, um, 
um, Samsung, I joined with the um, with the intention of getting involved in the web VR community group. Um, and thankfully, my um, my boss, uh, Daniel Applequest, is um, co-chair of the technical architecture group in the W3C. So he's really excited about standards and he's um, very excited to like enable other people to get involved in web standards. Um, so having him um, um, like make sure I had time to work on standard stuff was incredibly valuable. And then I was just very lucky that um, when the immersive web working group was starting, um, that I was just lucky enough um, to be asked to um, to help chair it. And so, yeah, that was um, um, that was just lucky happenstance, I think. Um, but I'm really happy to be involved. And it's just like, like, I probably wouldn't be able to be an editor for it. Like, I, I don't have the um, the in-depth um, like XR engineer um, background um, like the other like the editors do. Um, so it's just like, but I like to think I can through developer advocacy, I can bring a bit to the table. Um, and it's really good to be able to um, um, uh, to help where I can. Uh, that is true, and a very good view from a developer's perspective as well. Yeah, that's a good thing to to bring to it because um, I think it's important that developers are represented in the standards effort. Like, if they're not, then who are we making these APIs for? That is true. If they're not very usable, it's, if it's not super easy to create any content. There's no content, there's no uh, immersive web. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think I did get involved for the first time three years ago, uh, probably because of you. Uh, do you remember oh, yeah. the first time we met? Um, oh gosh, I have a terrible, terrible memory. So you'll have to remind me. Let me, me. remind you. Uh, it's funny. So we, we did talk uh, on Twitter about some panels um, and I wasn't able to do that. So I knew you through Twitter and um, there was a community group uh, session in Belgium at the time. I happened to be there and uh, I, probably you let me know. And I did go. And I woke up to you and also um, Jordan Santel, uh, both of you. I woke mm -hmm. up and said like, are you Ada? Uh, <laughs> and you were shocked and Jordan was shocked too. Like, oh my God, who's this person who knows my name, but I have no idea who they are. Um, <laughs> that terror <laughs> I saw on the face. Um, yeah. Oh, it's, it's always, um, that is definitely a weird thing about, um, uh, like being the public face of something because then people will come up to you and know your name and know stuff about you and I have no idea who they are and then I always feel so terrible and I'm just like oh no like we've probably spoken before and I like I have known memory for faces but also names like it takes me so long um, which probably isn't great for having like a, a career when I when I go around speaking to lots of people um, I think the career but, yeah. uh, is not helping either because um, we get to meet more people, way more people than a normal person would meet, right? It's like mm -hmm. every conference you go to, there are like hundreds, thousands, and you go to a lot of them and you have a lot of conversations. It makes it really hard. Yeah, it's 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 tricky. I, I wish I was I wish I was so much better at it. Um, I must come up, like I bet I come across as such a horrible peer person to some people when after they've had a really nice conversation with me like a couple of years ago and then I'll meet them again and be like you look really familiar but nothing gone. Uh, I think you should just hug people when, when that happens just directly hug them <laughs> well not in this situation with the COVID-19 mm -hmm. but um, you're a very good hugger and that will make everything much easier. Oh no, I'm so bad. Like I don't, I'm, I, I, um, most times if I go to a conference, if someone goes to hug me, I basically run away. <laughs> <laughs> that shows that you, yeah, you're British. Well, in California, uh, I think people are huggers, don't you think? People in California are huggers and that took a bit of getting used to. <laughs> oh, 
I hope you uh, get to move back here. And uh, but uh, things are changing. I doubt that we will go back to hugging each other anytime soon. I I don't think so. I think I think the culture around like keeping social distancing has probably changed indefinitely now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. Speaking of social distancing, I uh, have, did you get to try the Mozilla hubs for any of the events? I haven't tried it for any events. Like I've I've tinkered around in it and had a go at like setting up my own avatar. Um, but um, I haven't actually used it for any events yet, which is a real shame because because um, it's something I really want to try and I want to try it in both like from a laptop and also inside a VR headset because. What's the point of having like all the VR headsets if I don't actually like use it for? That is true. Um, but this is like I think if if this isn't the situation where like where web VR brings people well sorry, VR on the web like brings people together, then um, then I don't know what will. Yeah. That is true, uh, and it's such a it was such a good experience. I joined to another person's meeting, uh, and uh, they were very inclusive in the way that they also had a um, you know video uh, chat with the speakers and everybody. And if people prefer that, uh, that was available. But um, being on Mozilla Hubs enabled some mingling. Because there is spatial audio, I think people are more able to just go up to somebody and be in a circle and start talking about something uh, oh that's really good because that's definitely something you can't you like on zoom you can't just like go up to someone and whisper and be like hey what are they talking about <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but you can do that in it with spatial audio so that's really nice yeah and it allows uh, you know multiple conversation to uh, happen and the thing i really liked is they the heads are like big puppets and when you talk your head goes you know pul pulsates <laughs> and that allows you to know like who's talking uh but also it's a very funny effect i love it yeah that's really neat i really want to have another go at making um my own avatar for for hubs because i have i actually um commissioned someone to make a like a 3d model like cartoon version of me a while ago oh nice and so i really want to i really want to make it like compatible for hubs and have a go with it um like last time i tried i um i couldn't get it working through the uploader but i want to give it another go sometimes so i can like go into a space and be like hey it's me like it's it's actually me yeah uh, is there a specific format they accept do you know um so it's a special type of gltf file um well, it's not a special type of gltf but it's a gltf which has a particular um skeleton structure and then they'll animate the skeleton to do things like hands and stuff oh i um, see um one thing i was definitely not good at while i was modeling and doing animations was um doing rigging and putting skeleton on the person so yeah there's it's so tricky i, I can't do the joints like when it bends and then I, it always just collapses at the joint and i'm just like ah, oh, just just work yeah um it is hard <laughs> there's a lot of art to it uh do you do you miss the uh, modeling days um i miss having the ability to do it like i it was always nice to sit down as an editor and just be able to very quickly build the little bits of assets i need um but now i'm only getting back into it and i'm using i used to use maya and now i use blender um so like um I keep trying to use all of the old shortcuts and stuff like that and like they're not there and so I'm just like getting used to um even though Blender is now like since Blender 2.8 is like a lot better um I'm still getting used to it and like I'm just not that fast anymore and um it's just it's frustrating that it takes a long time to do something that I used to I used to be able to do very very quickly it is frustrating um, um, there are a lot of uh, open source models right now too, which uh, makes it really nice to be able to create a lot of stuff. Uh, one thing mm -hmm. I worked while I was at Autodesk, I mean, uh, my team generally worked, was uh, mm -hmm. helping Smithsonian Museum in Washington DC scan their artworks. 
And I think they oh. have completed it now and all of them are open source. You can yeah, download it. That's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, you can have your own museum in your house if you want to. Oh, that's actually really clever. I wish there was a search engine for 3D models like that. Just like there are, like, you know, if you like, if you want to find a JPEG, you can do an image search and you can filter by size and stuff like that. So I wish you could do like, like, I want a 3D model of like this particular bust from a museum. And then I want it like under 3000 polygons. Um, and then they'll be like, oh, here is here is that model in at that um, at that level of detail. Here you go. And then you can just like plonk it in the scene because um, having a huge library of like public domain assets like that would be so incredibly valuable. Um, but like, but modeling is such a such a difficult and like arduous process that um, I definitely um, it's like it's tough to balance having the stuff which is um, um, like having lots of stuff which is public domain but also making sure like artists get their due for um, the work they do so it's like I want I want both worlds I want artists to be paid a lot of money for the great work they do but also to have a large library of assets so that anyone without a lot of money or um, or experience can pull together some basic stuff to make a um like a nice scene in webxr and work work on stuff true thankfully there are enough uh, free open source things around um mm -hmm. microsoft had remix and uh, poly.org from yeah. google yeah. is a really great source for it too uh, but like for the big models like the one uh from smithsonian that doesn't mean that you still don't need an artist because i haven't tried it but uh, at the time i know that we were working with an artist who had to do a lot of cleanup because yeah. because it's a scan it's not very um web friendly format it's, there are a lot of polygons uh that needs to be cleaned yeah turning i remember there used to be some um like some machine learning back tools which would you could drop in a like a super high resolution scan and then it would turn it into a pretty low poly um, 3D model. Um, and then um, it just, I can't even remember who used to run it. It was one of the bigger companies, um, but then it just like vanished one day. I think, I think someone bought it out to integrate into their own product and then the free service just stopped. It could be um, Autodesk there. <laughs> I think it might have been Autodesk, yeah. Um, um, yeah, they turned. But it's um, um, they yeah. killed a few of the products that I really loved before as well. <laughs> there was um, a time a while ago. No, I think still now um, there aren't as many as there used to be. But like phone apps where you could like take um, like a hundred photos of an object and then it would like send it off to a service and give you like a a cleaned up 3D model of it. Um, and I really hope like more stuff, like I'm hoping there are, um, as as VR and AR in the web become more prevalent, I'm hoping um, more people build products on, on the idea of sharing 3D models the same way you would share a photo. Um, and um, I think, um, cause if you get, if you make it easy enough to, to take a photo of, of, um, to, if you t make it as almost as easy to take a 3d model of something as it is to take a photo, then I can really see people just creating, a, um, a lot more assets. Um, of course that doesn't get you like rigging and stuff like that. Um, but like it gets you like part way there with all the technology being more and more available with the depth sensing and everything it will be you know mm -hmm. very easy you're right i mean somebody has to build the product to clean up the models and make it a service yeah and it's it like if you do it automated it's like kind of an expensive thing just because the amount of, of processing it takes um so i wonder but i would i would pay for that like i would 
like if there was a service that let me download a um like a public domain scan drop it into or doing a scan of my own things and then have something else um clean it up really nicely so that i can just use it in a scene that would be so valuable um and i would pay a lot of money to i don't wouldn't pay a lot of money but I would definitely pay to use a service like that. A reasonable um, amount of money, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would pay a reasonable because like I haven't had, I don't make that much money, but um, I would definitely um pay to use it. Uh, what kind of applications are you looking forward to creating? Let's say you have all of the models, all of the rigging, everything you need. Time, uh, also, <laughs> is not an issue. What would you yeah. like to build? I just want to build, um, so I really, really like Rec Room. Um, what, and, what is that? Uh, so Rec Room is a, um, it's a VR uh, game. Uh, it's on like, it's on basically all of the major VR platforms out there. Um, and um, it's just like a sports game. So you go into a space and... There's a bunch of sports equipment you can use to to play stuff, but they do like paintball, um, and there's like sword fighting, and f- ultimate frisbee, and um, um, ping pong, and like there's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, like it's it's really fun, but you can just go there and hang out with people, and I think that'd be really great for the web. Like if you can just make us like make a scene put in some like basically like um you know how how in the sims you would just like make your house and like decorate it however you want Mm -hmm. um um i want people to do that in xr and then just be able to like hang out with each other in their virtual houses and and like play with various physics objects which are around and um I think that's the kind of thing where, like, I really, really like the idea of, um, like, the metaverse. I know it's such, like, a stupid VR concept, and it's just, like, a a sci-fi thing of just, like, being able to have your own virtual space Mm -hmm. where you can be on the web and have people join you and do social stuff there. And, like, you know how, like, all the GeoCities websites back in the 90s were just terrible and ugly, mm-hmm. um, but they were full of personality? Like, I want that for VR. I want really awful design, but I want people to be like, I like Evanescence and have a giant Evanescence um, poster in the sky and be like, oh, I really like, like, um, um, this particular car and so have, like, have a selection of like 3D models of all their favorite cars or spaceships or stuff like that. Um, like I want it to be like cheesy and silly and over the top. And I want people to have a space where they can like express themselves and be like, this is me, this is my space. This 3D space represents all the stuff that I love. Um, and then we can hang out here and we can throw a ball around or or make music on a on a giant xylophone. Oh wow, like that. yeah, that would be fun. Play games. Yeah, exactly. It's one like a space where people can just mess around and hang out. Like um cuz there's so much like people targeting like big corporate spaces. Um and I guess I think that's important that 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 VR and AR and the web can like make people money and productive. But I just, I just want Second Life, <laughs> but in VR on the web. Uh, did you spend a lot of time in Second Life? Um, not that much actually. Um, um, probably, like I spent, I don't know, like like tens, twenty, like tens to hundreds of hours in there. Not like, not like loads. Some people who spent like all their lives in there. But I definitely like found some like cool communities in there, and um, I always just liked how you could like change your own avatar so much, and there was like a um, like a huge amount of user generated content, mm-hmm. and um, I think that kind of thing in the web would just be really cool. Like having a persistent avatar between different 
social websites, like on different domains. Mm-hmm. Um, but having the same, like a consist, having a consistent representation of who you are between them, I think would be incredibly valuable. And um... lots of good ideas yeah. here. <laughs> I hope someone yeah. will hear and uh, start building it. Uh, me too. Me too. Me too. <laughs> For the second live on web, I think we have all of the pieces. We have the uh, Mozilla Hub. I'm not sure if you are you can create any plugins for it, but um, mm-hmm. the, some model uh, search mm-hmm. websites like Poly has APIs where you can uh, include it to your website and search for it and then import it. There was um, a really cool demo I saw a while ago um, for like building so like Mozilla Hubs has like an editor where you I think it's called Spoke where you can uh, you can design the the 3D environments, um, which is really cool. Um, but I think it'd be really neat if you could do it in VR. And there was a demo I saw a while ago where, um, um, do you remember the Quick Draw um, a Google experiment? Um, uh, not block. Uh, no, so there was this there was an experiment they did where you had like ten seconds or fifteen seconds to draw. Um, like they'd give you a word, you'd have fifteen seconds to draw it, um, and and it was just like a fun game, and then it would show you what other people did. Um, but as a result of that, um, if you if you draw something, you could then send it to the API. And then they can take a guess at what you drew. And they're pretty good at that. Mm. So someone made a demo where you draw a shape in VR. And then it sends it to the, like, the quick draw API. Works out what you built. Or like what, what you drew. And then does a search on Poly to get, the, to get the 3D model of that. And then pops it into your scene. Oh my god, that is so you, Yeah. Oh, so yes, you I draw remember. a bicycle. Yes, I remember And that. then... Talk. you have a bicycle in 3d and that to me is just like magic like that's the um and so i'd love to see that kind of thing if you just go into a scene you just like want a bicycle i want a tree and um and have it um like pull these things in for you um or you like i want like a particular image and then so you can look through your library of images and be like yeah i actually saw that talk in person uh augmented world expo awe a few years ago ah cool yeah uh it was really cool and uh having a game like that what a genius way of training your models too um machine learning models <laughs> yeah that's it's such a smart thing to do like it it was fun but also like crowdsourcing like a machine i mean like if that's one thing Google's known for, it's cr- it's crowdsourcing information for their machine learning algorithms. Um, but yeah, it's it worked it worked really well. It is um, very controlled too. You are giving the prop. You are saying this is a house or this is a tree, and then everybody is drawing their version. Um, and it's but it's amazing what people can do with just like you don't need like that many models to to be able to do something um like it's amazing seeing everyone's different islands in um in animal crossing because everyone builds these amazing um islands to their own personality but the the tools you have at your disposal to do that are extremely limited like there's not like there's not a huge amount of customization options like even the amount of stuff like texture space you have to draw on is 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 very limited um and just seeing what what people make out of that limited um, set of tools is incredible. And I really think um, like something that did similar something similar for VR, where sure you have like a limited set of models um, and and a limited space to draw your own textures. Um, but I think people can push that really far. And often by having constraints, it allows people to like unleash their creativity. Yeah, whenever you give people tools, you get amazed what comes out of it. Uh, yeah. Another really cool tool, if you haven't tried it, is a maquette. Have you heard of it? 
Um, it's in beta. So remind yeah. me what it is. Uh, I might have heard of it. It allows you to uh, uh, create designs in uh, VR. No, I don't think I've seen this. Is it um, on the Quest? Um, I think it's available on... Um, well, it's available on any VR device like Steam or Microsoft Store mm -hmm. too. It's a, it's a Microsoft product. It's in beta still, I think, and it's a very small team in Europe. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, the designs look really fun. And they do give, have a lot of examples with cool models in it too. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, right now I'm really stuck because unless it's in WebXR or on the or on the um, Oculus Quest, I'm really stuck because um, my office, as you can actually, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's, it's very, very tiny. Like there is a space for like a small desk and that's it. Um, and so my abilities to do um, like full immersive VR, which is tethered to a desktop computer, is, is yes. non-existent. Um, I recently c completed Alex, and when I did that, I had to, I had to um, move my whole like VR rig into the living room. Um, uh, unfortunately for my partner, because um, then it was taking up all the space. Uh, yeah, finding space is hard. Yeah, that's why untethered uh, headsets are really nice. It makes it much easier. Yeah, it really, really does. Um, especially being in London, where space is, is at a premium. Most people uh, are lucky to have even a single room where you can actually like do VR in. Um, Same in uh, San Francisco, <laughs> as you know. Uh, but there are a lot of interesting businesses around VR in San Francisco. One of them was right across from the office that I was working at. It was a mm -hmm. VR gym, which... Oh yeah. I didn't have a chance to try it out, but apparently you go in and everybody has uh, different uh, rooms and you don't get to talk to anybody or uh, anything. You go into a small room and then um, and then there's a scene, maybe you're fighting someone or like running away from something uh, and you have weights and stuff, which sounds cool. pretty cool. We had a museum too. I always... Yeah. Um, I always found um, stuff like that really like um, interesting that you can um, um, with where you can go somewhere and like have a go at really high high fidelity VR or make the most of a particular space or a suite of tools and stuff. But then it always squicked me out putting on like a headset, which I know a bunch of other people have been doing really like physically intensive work in because I know like it's going to be really sweaty. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm sure they figured that part out with some sort of... Oh yeah, like probably like changeable sponges or um, covers and stuff. Yeah, Yeah, that would be the worst uh, dream ever if that was the case. <laughs> um, yeah, during this, during this quarantine, probably the... Because I, I haven't been able to go running, um, uh, probably the most exercise I've been getting is just from playing Beat Saber. And they have a Fit Saber, I think, right? The new game. There's a new one. Um, I've just been playing like. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I I thought it was new after uh, this lockdown thing came out. It's a much faster. Like you really have to spend a lot of energy. It's Beat Saber. It's the same thing, but uh, just ah user. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've just been um, trying to like beat expert on um on oh shoot i forgot the name um uh the pop stars one um that brain is the league of legends song which my brain has forgotten the song name um i just been trying to beat that on expert and i'm i'm not that great at um, beat saber but it keeps me fit though yes me neither it's it's fun though uh but when you know that you're you're having a hard time and then watch other people do unbelievable things <laughs> uh you realize yeah people have really wide range of abilities there's someone on youtube and they're um um and they're really good at beat saber but they have like full body tracking um and it's 
really good tracking. I, I want to know what their setup is. Um, Me too. But they have so, it looks like they have so much fun playing Beat Saber. Like they're just dancing. Like they're not like stressed. They're just like chilling out. <laughs> And they're just like, I was like, whoa, they must be like really good at Beat Saber. And then like, like, oh yeah, they just beat this on Expert Plus whilst dancing. And it's just like, okay, all right. I didn't understand why people watch other people play games before Beat Saber. Now, <laughs> uh, I follow some people on my Instagram too. Like anytime, see, I'm just mesmerized. I, you know, get stuck in there watching the person. Um. <laughs> Oh, it's really good. Now I just want to go out and play Beat Saber again. <laughs> um, going back to your development experience, what kind of mm. tools do you really like to use? Uh, for building like VR stuff? Yes. Uh, for huh. example, the um, uh, web XR de uh, debugging tools are really cool and super helpful for me. Is there anything that um, you like? Sorry, the, the audio broke up a bit then. I, um, I missed that. Um, I was asking any developer tools that you like to use for building WebXR or any general XR experiences. Uh, one of them um, is, um, I'm sure you're, you're familiar, the WebXR uh, developer tool extension, the plugin that you can add. Yes, the, the WebXR um, extension is incredibly useful. I, I use that all the time. Um, just um yeah pretty much like the way i develop is um is like i'll i'll refresh the page just to make sure it still works in my browser if it works there then i test it using the um the extension make sure everything works as i expect and um make sure like the code actually runs in uh, webxr and then i then i finally once i've done a few iterations will then try it out on the quest um just because putting like the headset on and off and on and off and on and off is just really frustrating. Um, and it's also hard to um, like debug, um, like getting it hooked up to developer tools is really tricky. Um, so I I generally don't even bother. Um, like if something's breaking in the quest and I can't like debug it through the headset, um, then I will, um, I will just be like, um, uh, do what I can to debug it through the emulator extension instead. Um, although the trick I've got to doing recently is, um, is, um, like rendering out to a canvas and putting, doing like canvas to texture just so I can have like, at least I can do console log kind of thing. Uh -huh. Um, and I can have like a, just a little, um, readout on my wrist of like what's happening so I can understand where stuff is breaking. But yeah. Are you using the API that uh, allows you to get like a uh, camera shot? Is that what, how are you doing oh, no, I'm, cameras? Um, so what I would do, I would um, like, I would just use like the canvas, the canvas 2D API to write some text to a canvas. And then I would load that as a canvas texture. And then I would stick that on a mesh, which I would put on my wrist. So I can just look at my wrist and see what the, the current like logs are oh cool um, that is really nice um yeah i hope one day like the um, mobile device profiles are available on the dual portals one day maybe the headsets will be available as well that would be really cool mm -hmm. <laughs> like it is really handy in the um WebXR emulator extension that at least you can set what what hardware is currently in mm -hmm. um and so even though it can't, um, um, even though it can't set the, like, like, or it can't fake the render, render stack and stuff like that, it will up still update the, um, the controllers that are connected, like the virtual controllers. So if, if you are using like WebXR input profiles, you can actually see the 3D models change as you go through the different controllers, which I think is super neat. Oh, nice. I have to try um, that. Um, but yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, the other tool I use a lot, like I do a lot of development on Glitch um, just because it's really handy so I can um, I can edit stuff in the um, in the Glitch editor online and then it 
I have a URL and I can just send that URL to people and they can try it out too. Um, and that's like, for me, the highlighting like the key benefit of building stuff on the web. Like I can send stuff to anyone and I don't have to care what headset they're using, whether they're using like a cardboard or a Quest or some high-end tethered headset. Like I know WebXR will just work and I can just send them the URL and and Glitch goes hand in hand with that because then I have the, I just use the editor and it's already uploaded it and given me a URL I can, I can ship with. So that's really, really neat. Yeah. Uh, and you're a Glitch queen and <laughs> automating everything on Glitch and uh, it is really nice. <laughs> you inspire me to use it more. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a pretty cool tool. Um, like for, um, it's, I'm just really lazy and it's much easier for me to like remix one of my old projects or remix someone else's project and just start tinkering um, than it is to like set up like a, a digital ocean droplet um, and do stuff there. Like it's, so for me, it's just me being lazy. <laughs> um, it is good to be lazy. It enables a lot of innovations. Um, maybe actually it would be a good idea to uh, have copies of the WebXR samples on Glitch because uh, somebody recently on WebXR Reddit was complaining about like, not knowing how to run it on uh, their local machine or they tried another uh -huh. uh, online editor, I think, and couldn't get it to work. Uh, it would be nice uh -huh. to give that option. The samples are interesting, but lots of them don't use popular libraries. Like They just use like a very, very minimal like the, the 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 minimum possible of a framework you need to actually do VR, and the rest of it they kind of implement themselves, um, which makes them great as just like pure reduced test cases. But for like getting other developers to to work on them, I tend to just tell people like, yeah, use a frame or three JS or um, or Babylon or React three sixty, um, and then it's it's just WebXR is just built in to the to the thing, and you don't even need to worry about it. You just um, you just do whatever it takes in the framework to add the VR button, and generally it will it will just work. Yes, um, uh, and all of those libraries have pretty good example sets as well. Mm. Yeah, I... yeah, they really do. <laughs> um, I do plan to have a series of workshops uh, for Babylon for, because uh, of the San Francisco WebXR uh, meetup, which we are doing online now. Mm. So it's not San Francisco. Uh, have a series of tutorials would be fine. Anything I should build uh, for the tutorials? Um, what kind of mm. questions do you? Are you going to do AR stuff, AR stuff or VR stuff? stuff? Uh, both. Yeah. Uh, so one of the interesting things I did with, um, which I think people really like is when you have, um, um, some VR thing that goes into the surface it's on. Um, so you do stuff where you like occlude the area around, um, um, the thing you're showing so that you can, um, um, so it looks like there was like a whole in the table mm, yes. and then like something comes out the hole and I kind of love doing that kind of thing. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, and but I, yeah, I always do like really basic stuff like that. Like download a 3d model, place it on a table. Yay. You did AR. Um, but it is uh, fun and interesting. It makes your table suddenly very magical. It really does. It's it's very exciting, and I'm really glad that the hit testing API is like is starting to land um, in browsers more now. Because um, like that was like the one thing WebXR really needed to suddenly go from ah oh, this is interesting to ah oh, now I this is fun and cool and I want to I want to play with it. Um, I mean like WebXR like AR stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that that's really neat. Um, I also really like how you can build one thing and show how it can work in virtual reality and augmented reality, um, which is also very cool. That is a good idea. That is true. And there are some differences too. I'm actually uh, looking at some of the VR applications and put, putting them on HoloLens and 
um, you know, it's um, it's good to you know show how you can do that same thing on a uh, on WebXR. And uh, for the, the first application that you mentioned, lighting estimation would be really really helpful, which is uh, one of the uh, community group discussions. Is there any other, what, what are the um, specs that you're most excited about? Ah, so, yeah, so lighting estimation is a really good one. Um, um, I also really like anchors, which I think is going to be really good for having, um, just for just like for high fidelity AR, like the ability to have something that's really anchored to a scene and like doesn't really drift that much is incredibly valuable. Um, I'm also really looking forward to hand input because um, um, both because it would be really nice to natively have like a hand model in VR because like a, a lot of people's favorite um, um, like VR experiences even though you're still holding a controller will show you a, a, a hand mm -hmm. and I think having that natively in WebXR is incredibly valuable. Um, as well as being able to just use your hands if exposed through the API without needing to use a controller at all is going to be really, really useful. Um, and I think it's going to be really nice that because um, it's really cool in the HoloLens demos where you can just go up to something and pick up a model out the air with your real hands. Um, so I really hope that um, um, that like like that becomes um um, like a really useful API soon so that you can just start doing those really cool magical demos like the kind of demos to get people looking at their own hands like building those in XR yes um, Manish actually built uh, one like that and I have a video of me looking at my hands <sighs> I love it I love it you have to send that to me I want to see it uh, yes it's on my YouTube I'll put the link um, yeah it is fascinating I just seeing your hand and hands are very animated too. So uh, that's also very interesting because he has all the knuckles uh, in there as well. Oh, that's amazing. That's, that's incredibly cool. I love, um, I love that now so much work in the immersive web working group and community groups are like just going on in parallel. And it's just exciting to see all these amazing things all happening at once. Um, and I'm just I'm so excited for this. Like it really feels like we're we're making huge strides. Um, thanks to all the work of like the editors and and everyone involved in the in the groups. Um, I don't know how Manish finds the time, uh, not as well as Brendan, not to just uh, be an editor, but also go ahead and implement it and um, share their demos with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, um, I feel so lucky that like just being able to play with stuff as it lands, it's, it's very cool. Um, and I'm interviewing Manish next, so stay tuned <laughs> to his interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. I can't wait to, to listen to it. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, we do s used to see each other a lot for, because of the, uh, you know, uh, works in close uh, offices and uh, Holland's events that he and I mm. talked. Uh, I used to see him more often than my own co-workers, but uh, it's not happening <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's really tricky with um, uh, with the pandemic. Yes. Um, lastly, I want... I... Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I, um, I really miss having the face-to-faces because that's like my one time where I get to see everyone in the group and actually like say hello in person to like the other editors and the... Um, um, and the and um, all the participants in the in the groups and and because of Corona, like all of the all of the meetings are just cancelled, and so um, it feels like I haven't seen anyone in so long. That is true. It's a totally different experience to just mingle in, in the corridor too. Like the conversation we were having, we were able to have it all together with all of these people who are so passionate about WebXR. And uh, I'm so glad I was able to catch uh, the one in February, um, but it's so sad that we are not going to have it have it for a long time. 
oh gosh, it was only in February. I think it's literally just that the last, like, three months have been so harrowing that, like, February feels like a lifetime ago. It does. It really does. Um, was the face-to-face meetings every three months? Uh, we normally have them every, like, like twice a year. Like, there'll be one, like, one during TPAC, which is the technical plenary and AC advisory committee uh, meetings at the W3C, um, which uh, is like a big meeting where all of the working groups get together and have lots of discussions um, to try and solve their own issues, but try and, like... Um, um, uh, try and work with other groups on like overlapping interests to make sure you're not like stepping on toes and stuff like that um, and then we normally have another one just just for our group um, where we just try and run through as many issues as we can tie up loose ends um, finish stuff off um, and and get to have like the bigger longer deeper conversations which you can't really do on a call uh, that is true I know we are recording, uh, not recording actually, but um, we have an online version of the same event too. Are they available to uh, general public or just the community uh, group? Um, so the com- anyone can join the community group um, and anyone can take part in the meetings which are for the community group. Um, um, but because of IP reasons, the bits which are for the working group um, have to be like kind of kept separate. Um, currently, there's almost an entire entire perfect overlap between the community group and the working group. Um, uh, like not quite, but like um, uh, most people are um, are in both, so it's not so bad. Um, but if people did want to. Um, attend some of the community group um, meetings and they're more than welcome but also all of the the minutes from the meetings and all the work we do in general is all pretty much done in the public um, and is um, and is available throughout through the immersive web github and can be read Um, um, it might also be worth doing um, next time we do a um, a meeting doing a um, like a public, like show and tell, um, mm-hmm. where people can show off their demos and we can have like talks and stuff where, where people can ask questions of people in the group and see where stuff is coming and stuff. That that could be definitely something which would be worth for us looking into. Um, Such a great idea. For the, yeah. Because um, I think we definitely want to do some kind of online call around TPAC this year. And so... It might be definitely worth doing something like that. Uh, it always inspires me, and you know, it's a great way to learn what is coming uh, in what are people are working on by just watching people do show and tell and like talk about how they build it. It is really nice. Um, is there any other way that you you would like anyone to contribute? Uh, so we have community group that people can sign up and we have the open source uh, proposals discussions uh, but mm. let's talk about building tools and other ways to contribute yeah this um like probably the best way to contribute is to um is to just try out and make something like make something using the webxr device api and if you have any trouble like report it back to the um, to the libraries you're working with, um, or if it's an issue with the API itself, report it back into the standards effort. Um, um, like, um, although most of the APIs are pretty solid right now and um, they're not likely to change hugely, like they're still not fully fully baked yet. Um, so if people do have issues, now is definitely the time to to start reporting them before um, the changes become like um, impossible and before fixes become impossible to make um, without breaking like compatibility. Um, so yeah, building stuff, making sure um, like various popular libraries have support for um, all the different bits of the WebXR device API. 
and as more and more of it lands in browsers um like it's good to to make sure that they get implemented in the in the various frameworks and stuff as well because it's moving very quickly now and and it seems like every few months like a new um a new chunk of functionality lands um true and uh, we don't know everybody's use case and uh there might be some use cases that we're not able to think. It would be really nice to see uh, what people Precisely. find hard. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. And you can do that on GitHub uh, issues. I'll put the link there too. Yes, we have um, like our issues are, our issues are open. Um, like if you have an issue with a particular framework um, or implementation, like um, we can't really help, but if there is a, an issue where the API isn't itself isn't um, able to to fulfill your use case, then please let us know because that's incredibly important. Yes, otherwise it's on us uh, for the future developers to yell at us and say like, "What were you thinking?" <laughs> Yeah, I really hope um, I really hope people are like, wow, this is a really nicely designed API. Good job. Rather than being like, why did they do that stupid decision? Because I know there's definitely a fair share of web APIs where I've looked at them and gone like, what were they thinking? This is a disaster. Yeah. And I'm hoping they don't think about, ho I hope people don't think about that, about some of the stuff that we've made. Yes, there won't be a talk uh, like WebEx are the good parts. <laughs> no, oh my God. Like just hearing that that title just like hurt the heart. It does. So act now. <laughs> now is the time. I want, like if I were to do that, it'd be WebEx are the good parts with just brackets, all of it. Yay. Yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> um. Lastly, I don't want to let you go before you talk about your grandma and what you uh -huh. have behind you. So yeah, uh, this is my grand. Actually, I'll focus the camera back. Um, so this is my grandma's golden joystick. Uh, this is her Mega Drive. Um, and um, put this back on me. Um, so yeah, um, the, um, ah, I'm out of focus. I'll just do, do, do. Um, yeah. So, um, my grandma was a TV gamer in the early nineties, like, and she was still a grandma back then. Um, and, um, she saw like a, a TV game show where they had like kids, playing video games for like prizes and stuff and she was just she phoned up the company like the people running it and being like I saw the kids playing video games and they were terrible I could do much better than them and I'm a grandma <laughs> and so they invited her on the show to have a go at beating kids at video games um and she ended up being like a small tv personality about it um and she even won a golden joystick um um from Games Master. Um, that is amazing. Um, beating people at fighting games. So yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. Um, and and if she's probably the person who got me into tech in the first place. Like um, like I, I never had any video games, consoles, or computers, um, um, and for much of my childhood. Um, Except when I went round to my grandma's house, where she play, I used to play on her Amiga and, and her Mega Drive. Um, that is so amazing. that was always super cool. How do you think she got into it? Um, apparently, um, she was really bored whilst pregnant with my dad, <laughs> and that was how she like kind of got into games. Um, um, are you sure she didn't work at Bletchley Park and afterwards, you know, life was boring? <gasps> No, um, just, yeah, it's just, um, it's just amazing. Like she just, um, she just picked up games one day because she was bored and is just really good at them. And, um, she used to like amaze me with, um, um, with video games when I was a kid and I'd like watch her like be incredible at Sonic and stuff like that. Um, it was, she was, she was my idol. It was amazing. 
That is literally the coolest grandma story I ever heard. It is amazing. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it makes me um, like I'm um. She really inspired me, and and like playing games at her house is what made me want to go into like games and and making my own games is made me is what made me want to go into graphics. So I can literally trace it all back to back to her. Uh, it is very nice. Were you able to uh, impress your grandma as a kid with your game? Um, um, I don't. I'm. Yeah, she's. She always. She always beat me at games. Um. Um, yeah, she was. Um, she was always really amazing at it. Uh, it's incredible, especially thinking back. I mean, I, I'm sure the games she was playing weren't advertised for her or, you know, for her demographic. Oh, yeah, they were they were all aimed at kids. Um, like they were just like like various fighting games. And um, she's or she like completed Lemmings, um, which was like this game where you had to like um, move the Lemmings into um, uh, get them to complete various tasks and, and complete the level and try and save as many as you can but she would like she would complete lemmings where she would like the whole game but we're saving every single one which um like is incredibly difficult task to do um and this was before like there were like let's plays online and stuff like that like she solved it all herself and it's just like um yeah it's incredible um <laughs> I can't imagine. And actually, thinking back, like it, um, advertising games to work for grandmas and grandpas is such a good idea because there are a lot of research that shows uh, playing games really increases your reaction time. And uh, that's mm. something that you lose uh, when you age too, which is a super helpful thing to have. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Um. But often, it, often it's not games like Sonic the Hedgehog and like Mortal Kombat and stuff. <laughs> oh. Yes, well, definitely I wouldn't have guessed that that would be uh, something for a mother to be, especially at the time that she was mm. playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you for sharing your amazing stories and your incredible experience. Um, so oh, good thank to you have so you. much for having me it's been really nice yes and so glad finally we had a time to chat about lyrics art and have some tea <laughs> yeah it's been really good and um, and I hope to, to, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to speak to you again very soon because we work together <laughs> <laughs>